All right, hey, I'm out there in banjo land. Mike Heading here. I've got a free banjo lesson for you today. This one's gonna be more on the beginner side. And I wanna talk about some common mistakes I see beginners make when they're trying to learn to play bluegrass banjo. So these are gonna be specific to bluegrass banjo if you're learning claw hammer or tenor banjo or some other style of banjo, these aren't all gonna fit. But if you wanna learn bluegrass, three finger scrub style banjo, these are some of the most common mistakes I see as a, as a beginner, I made a lot of these and I see them as a teacher interacting with a lot of students. So these are some of the most common mistakes I, I see, like I said, and these ones are going to be more about attitude and mindset rather than technical mistakes, left and right hand technical mistakes. I have a lot of other videos that talk about basic left and right hand technique and you can watch those if you want to see my, some of my common technical mistakes. But these mistakes are going to be more based on attitude and mindset, which is also really important, right? All the practice and all the talent in the world isn't necessarily going to help you if you have a really bad mindset and a bad attitude. That's probably one of the biggest predictors of whether you're going to make progress is your mindset, your attitude. I know as a teacher, it's immediately apparent to, to me, the student's attitude and mindset. It totally changes the, the interaction, the teacher student interaction. And it's a pretty big predictor of whether you're going to make progress. So like I said, attitude and mindset is very important, obviously. And it's, it's challenging to have a good attitude when you're first starting. You're kind of in this unknown, uncharted territory, right? And it can be very challenging at first and you don't necessarily see the rewards right away. So that's what we're going to talk about for this lesson. All right, let's get into mistake number one. Okay, so for the first mistake I see among complete beginners, and it's a very common one, pretty much almost everyone does it, is spending time playing without your picks. So bluegrass style banjo, three finger style banjo is played with picks on your right hand. And it's so common when you first start because you, you hear, okay, I'm supposed to play with picks. And then you put the picks on and they feel really clumsy. They feel really fumbly. You're not sure if you even put them on right. And there's an initial urge to just want to abandon the picks because it feels easier at first to play with your fingers. And I get this message all the time from students, usually people that are just starting out that say, you know, I'm not gonna use the picks. I feel better, I can play better with just my fingers and I'm gonna keep, keep on this path without the picks. And I always kind of tell people, it definitely feels easier to play without the picks at first, but you have to ask yourself, is that going to get you to where you want to go? Don't focus on what's easier at first. Focus on, is it going to get you to where you need to be long term? Because honestly, playing without the picks isn't going to get you where you need to go long term. It's It feels like an easier route at first, but it's actually leading you into a dead end that you're eventually going to have to work backwards and take the path of learning with the picks if you want to play bluegrass. So I always tell people just, get through the initial part of playing with the picks. It's it's uncomfortable and challenging for everyone. And so why it's different with the picks is you're actually playing on a subtly different part of your finger if you're playing without the picks. So if I don't have the picks on, I naturally have to play more on the pad of my right hand fingers because that's gonna be the strongest, flattest part that's gonna hit the string. But when I have the picks on, you'll actually notice that I'm actually, the, the part that's touching the string now actually is above my finger. So I've extended my reach. So when I'm playing with the picks, I can actually do less work with my right hand once I get it down. Playing without picks, it's going to train your fingers on your right hand to move more than they need to. So you're gonna be, training basically the muscle memory incorrectly you're going to have to dig into the strings a lot more because you don't have that extended reach you're also going to have to play a lot harder adding a lot more tension to your right hand to be able to get even close to equivalent volume without the picks so i don't have picks on right now i'd have to play to where i'm hitting the strings really really hard to even get close to the same amount of volume and lastly, the other thing that's going to happen when you start playing without picks and that you won't notice right away, but will happen over time is you're going to build calluses on your fingers 
that are eventually going to start catching on the strings in a weird way. So the picks, because they're metal, give you that ultimate consistency when you're hitting the string. So I don't really think it's possible to play fast and clean without your picks. It just You're not going to have that reach. You're not going to have the volume necessary. So those are all benefits to playing with the picks. The other question I get regarding the picks a lot is, okay, maybe I need to play quieter. And every time I put my picks on, I play super loud. So one, you can just practice playing quieter. That's a skill that you got to practice. So you might need just to spend a little time with that. If you're in a special situation where you actually need the banjo to be quieter, a couple things you can do. You can get a banjo mute that lays across the bridge. There's different ones, different brands you can check out. If you don't want to spend any money, a very cheap option to create a little banjo mute is clipping either one or two clothes pins on the bridge. So on either side of the strings, clip a clothes pin and that's going to mute the sound quite a bit actually. And the other thing you could do is open the back of the banjo if you have a resonator banjo in stuff like a towel or a sweatshirt or something in there. And basically that's gonna dampen the sound quite a bit. So between those three options, that's what I would do if you wanna play quieter. One is just practice playing quieter with the picks. Two is get some sort of banjo mute or clothespins. And three, put a shirt or a blanket or something in the, in the pot of the banjo to quiet it down. So, Unless you've been playing multiple years and you're already pretty successful playing the banjo, I wouldn't spend any time practicing without your picks, honestly. I almost spend zero, probably zero percent of the time pr practicing with, without my picks. Almost, almost never. Maybe the only time I do is if I'm writing a tab for, for one of my arrangements on the computer and I just really quickly need to try it to make sure it works and I'm just typing on my computer so I don't want to keep putting my picks back on and, and off. But if I'm ever in a, like a full-blown banjo practice session, I always play with my picks. So that's mistake number one, is trying to take that initial shortcut of it seems easier to play without the picks, so I'm going to go that route, when we need to plow through that initial difficulty and continue to play with our picks, all right? So here's mistake number two. So for mistake number two, and I want to put in quotes mistake for this one because this one comes from a really good place. There's good intentions behind this mistake. So I hesitate to call this mistake, but I'm going to just because I think it's an important concept to think about. So I hear a lot from students, and I know I said this myself when I first started playing, was it's kind of a way to play it safe is you say, okay, my goal is actually just to play in a room by myself. And I don't really care about playing with other people, but my goal is just, to, I just want to be able to play and entertain myself. And I would encourage you strongly to set a bigger goal. B basically, be more imaginative. And you don't have to set the goal that you're going to play on the Grand Ole Opry or something like that, or, or you know, be famous, or even play in a band. But I want you to set the goal higher than that. I want you to set the goal basically involve other people in your goal. So it could be playing with your spouse, it could be playing with one friend, could be playing at your local church, could be going to a bluegrass jam. I want you to build some sense of community in your ultimate goal. And it doesn't mean that you can't play at home by yourself and entertain yourself. I do that all the time. I want you to think of that as an ancillary benefit, not your ultimate goal. Because it's going to be really hard to stay motivated if you don't have that community engagement. If you're just trying to play to entertain yourself, it's going to be so much easier to give up, to quit, to not practice. It's, I, just, I can't emphasize that enough. Building in community to your playing and telling people that you play the banjo or you're learning a new instrument is so powerful. It's Again, from a teacher's perspective, it's one of the biggest predictors of success. Anyone that tells me that their only goal is to play in the room by themselves, I a little bit of a red flag gets immediately raised for me and I worry about that person's long-term success. If you don't build community and accountability into your playing and practice, it's you might be able to power through and learn by yourself, but it's much more a a predictor of success if you have community, people you're accountable towards, 
So I'd encourage you to set a bigger goal. My analogy for this is always imagine you were learning a new language. Let's say I went to a party and someone said, hey, Mike, what do you, what's the new thing you're, you're uh, interested in? And I said, oh, I'm learning Spanish. And they said, oh, wow, that's so cool. And I said, you're never going to guess what my goal is. My goal is to learn it well enough that I can speak it in a room by myself. People would look at you very strange, I think. So think of it in terms of music is a language in this analogy. So we need to add that level of community to the language. That's going to, that interactivity is so important. It's such a powerful piece of music. So I can't emphasize that enough. Again, I'm not saying you can't practice and play to entertain yourself on your porch. That's, again, a, a great benefit. And it can be an initial goal, but I want you to set a longer term goal higher. Okay, so that's that's mistake number two. It's basically setting too safe of initial goal. You know, you're hesitant to set a bigger goal. I found, I know this was for me, especially when I first started playing violin. I set a goal. I, I didn't want to ever have to play in front of anyone else because I was too embarrassed. And it really limited my playing. I got so much better, so much faster when I allowed myself to stumble and to play in front of other people. So I can't emphasize that enough. Build that community into your playing and practicing. It's going to pay off benefits. All right, let's look at mistake number three. Okay, so mistake number three is pretty easy. And this is going to be, again, kind of a philosophical one. There's not going to be a one-size-fits-all answer to this. But mistake number three is getting too concerned on the rules, quote-unquote rules of music or banjo too early. You want to build good technique and you want to follow the rules, but you don't want that to be a hindrance to your playing. We need to walk before we can run. We need to crawl before we can walk. So the rules are something that you can learn later on. And I think this more is with like music theory stuff. I see a lot of beginners, maybe the first page of their music book or banjo book that they bought shows them a scale. So they memorize this scale, they kind of learn the rules of the scale, but they don't have any underlying ability to play yet. So they get stuck on that scale and they don't know when to use it. So they get caught up in the minutia of the rules and then they get stuck. So how to combat that is basically to kind of, if plow through basically would be the, the best way to say it, is you can play and digest stuff knowing full well that you don't fully understand it yet. And those rules are going to come later on. Again, back to our analogy of language. If you tried to learn what a noun was before you could speak a couple basic words in that new language, that would be out of order, right? So same thing here. So if you have a book that has a bunch of rules right off the bat on how to make a chord, how to make a scale, what I would recommend is skip that right off the bat, come back to it, get some early wins playing some actual music. Even if it's just fumbling around on your banjo making random sounds, that's a better initial thing to start with than trying to memorize a bunch of rules that you, 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 you don't understand the game yet. So learning the rules aren't going to be helpful. Okay. So that's mistake number three. Okay. And mistake number four now is again, going to be kind of up to you but think of this as extreme. So mistake number four is only playing with tab or never playing with tab, right? So it's the two extremes. So back to our language analogy, reading tab is like being able to read a language. Playing by ear is like being able to hear and speak a language. Obviously, if you go to a new country that you're speaking a new language, there's benefits to speaking the language, right? There's benefits to being able to read the language, right? So we don't want to be on either extreme in this case where we have to have music at all times or vice versa. We're so scared of reading tab or looking at tab that we just avoid it altogether. And I see this, again, very commonly on the extremes. Someone that's been playing a few years but has to have the music in front of them at all times or vice versa, someone that's been playing a few years and you could put a very simple piece of music in front of them and they couldn't play it or stumble through it without hearing it first. So just think of yourself and trying to find that balance in the middle where you can play some by ear and you can play some 
by, by reading, right? So find that balance for yourself. There's not going to be a one size fits all, but think of it as a continuum. And if you find yourself drifting to one side of the continuum, work on the other skill, right? Learning to play by ear is a skill, learning to read is a skill. If you neglect either one of those skills, you're going to be deficient in that area. So to be a well-rounded player and musician, you really need to be able to read some type of music and you need to be able to hear and play music without reading the music in front of you at all times. Okay, so that's mistake number four. Lastly, mistake number five is avoiding changing your own strings. So this is a very common thing for beginners. And I think it's not that you can't get better without learning to change your own strings, but I think it's a very powerful tool to kind of give you ownership over the experience of playing the banjo. It's gonna build up your confidence that you can deal with basic problems with the banjo. So it doesn't mean that you have to become a setup master. You don't need to know how to tighten the head or adjust the truss rod if you don't want to, but learning to change the strings is a very simple way to empower yourself to take more ownership over the instrument. So I know I used to make my dad change my strings when I first started, and I think I, he did it maybe four or five times, and he finally said, all right, you need, to, you need to learn how to do this by yourself. So that was eye-opening for me. But again, when you build up that confidence that you can change the strings and have an elementary understanding of how the banjo is set up and works, it's gonna increase your confidence in your playing as well. So that's mistake number five, is kind of just avoiding any setup things whatsoever. So take some ownership over your own banjo, learn to change the strings. You're gonna like new, new strings, I imagine, or at least you'll see what they feel like, and you can take it from there. All right, so that's mistake number five. Okay, so for two more bonus mistakes that I thought of that I just think are important that we should talk about real briefly as well are, one is having no banjo heroes. So almost every good player that I've ever talked to, heard, interviewed, read about, they have very explicit influences. Listen to Bela Fleck talk about the first time he heard Earl Scruggs. He has a vivid memory of it since he was like, when he was like five years old or something like that. So you can tell how instantly that affected him. One of the biggest things I see with students that makes me worried when, when I have a new student come in and I ask him, oh, well, who do you like? Why do you want to learn the banjo? If you can't name a single banjo player you like, to me, that's a big issue. It's gonna, it, again, it goes back to the motivation and the mindset, kind of your why of why are you playing the instrument? For me, I heard J.D. Crow and Ron Stewart. I have a whole list of banjo players. I heard those on recordings and I said, I've gotta be able to do that. I don't, whatever it takes, I'm gonna be able to do that. And that why can power you through those challenging times. The banjo is a very challenging instrument. Learning any instrument is challenging and rewarding. So very challenging, very rewarding, right? So having that why is so important to get you through those challenging times, maybe where you feel like you're plateauing. Having that why, having those heroes that you, oh, I gotta be able to play like that guy or gal. It's so important. Think of that like there's kind of this fire inside you, this banjo fire, right, that can go up or down, it can burn out. And if you stoke that fire with banjo heroes, people that you just absolutely love and you wanna be able to play like, it's just gonna, it's gonna stoke that fire. It's gonna get you through those tough times where you feel like you're not getting better. So have some banjo heroes. That's the one of the biggest mistakes, again, I see with beginners is they kind of just, hey, I'm learning the banjo, but I don't really know why. I, I don't really like banjo music. And it's not that you have to be obsessed with bluegrass, but have one or two banjo players that you really love. Maybe you don't even know why you like them, but you say, hey, that guy or that gal, I, I love her playing. So that's so important is to have a why. And the very last bonus tip I would say is if you're gonna take lessons in person, make sure you vet your banjo teacher. I've seen this a lot with students that come to me after they've worked with another teacher. And usually it's when that teacher is mainly a guitar player and they kind of play banjo on the side, usually that doesn't lead to as good of an outcome. I've had a couple unfortunate people that I've worked with where they worked with another or teacher for a few years, and basically we had to kind of start back at, at almost square one because the teacher just w wasn't quite qualified to teach them the banjo. This happens a lot because 
I found that a lot of times at a music store, maybe they have a guitar teacher and someone calls for banjo lessons and then they, they go ask the guitar teacher, hey, do you think you could teach some banjo? We don't want to turn this student away. Oh, okay, I'll, 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 I'll borrow a banjo from my friend and I'll, I'll, I'll start learning how to teach banjo. So I would always say vet your teachers. Make sure they've taught other banjo students. Maybe ask how many, how many banjo students they have. Ask them if they're mainly a guitar player. Ask them if they've played bluegrass banjo. So these are all things that are really important. And I've seen, again, I, I, I've, I find it most with, with teachers that are mainly guitar players and ki kind of play banjo on the side. They just don't have the foundational technique and skills to be able to set you up for that foundation to play bluegrass. They might be able to teach you some basic music skills, but to play traditional bluegrass banjo, I would find a teacher that really plays banjo, loves bluegrass, and is willing to teach you that style. All right, hopefully this helps you out, gives you some things to ponder. And again, you're always trying to find your own way and, and what works best for you. But these are some tips that have worked for me. So hopefully it helps you out. Good luck and keep picking.